These two new ways of thinking changed history. They were faith and reason. Faith meant all the objective truths that we can know by faith, and reason meant all the objective truths that we can know by reason. What is theology? Theology is the study of God. You're listening to Reason and Theology, where both faith and reason intersect. Well, good evening, everyone. This is Michael with Reason and Theology. I am today joined by co-host Craig Trulia and guest David Bates. David is a Catholic speaker and a software engineer who lives in San Diego, California, where he worships at a Byzantine Rite Catholic parish. And he runs the website Rest, RestlessPilgrim.net and co-hosts PintsWithJack.com. David, how are you today? It's great to have you, by the way. I'm very well. Thank you for inviting me. I got Absolutely. very excited. It, yeah. it kind of feels like being invited to the, the grown-ups table. <laughs> <laughs> Look, the, the honor is all here. And, and by the way, uh, just for full disclosure, uh, David is the one who helped get the podcast uh, up and running. So everybody who's listening via podcast, you have David to thank for that. So uh, we, we very much appreciate you for that. You're welcome. I had seen the, the YouTube channel and really liked it, but I can see most of my stuff through podcasts. And so I reached out and said, you guys have got to get this on podcast. Yeah, you, you and, were definitely, you came in the nick of time too, because a number of people were messaging me saying, hey, when are you going to get this on podcast? And I was doing my best to, you know, make do with what I could uh, try to figure out on my own, but I, I just wasn't able to do it. So I definitely appreciate it. <laughs> uh, Craig, how are you? I see you got the blue Yeti mic. It's red. Well, it, a blue it's a red, blue Yeti mic, but no, I'm, <laughs> I'm doing good. And it's uh, kind of a, a full circle thing to uh, be able to have Dave here tonight. Excellent. And you, and I see you got a new laptop there too. Uh, I can kind of tell the difference in just some of the resolution. Then I spent my money wisely. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. All right. Well, David, let's jump into this. Let me first ask, um, are you a convert to Catholicism or a cradle Catholic? I am a revert. So I was born and raised Catholic and we were in a very active patch. I was an altar boy and I really liked my time there. And then I started in England, what we call secondary school. So I was about 10 years old and we then started going to the monastery that was attached to the school. It was a Benedictine monastery and all of that was great. My faith ticked along nicely, but it was at university where my faith really, really came alive. I encountered a missionary from the group Verbum Dei. So this is a, a Catholic community, an ecclesial community, or one, one of those other communities. And it was through one of, the, one of the missionaries there that my faith really, really came alive. Mm -hmm. And their, their big focus, they had two. It was prayer of the word. So they didn't call it this, but basically mm -hmm. Lexio Divina. Mm -hmm. And evangelism, evangelization. They really, really cared about that. And so I graduated from university and it was then that I went out into the big wide world and saw what it was like at a typical Catholic parish. <laughs> right. And that was amazingly depressing <laughs> because I had gone from a community that really cared about their faith, growing in their faith, spending time in the word uh, and felt that we had something to share, that something that the world needed. And I then found myself in a parish where people didn't seem to think that, mm -hmm. uh, where the, it was the usual complaints from most people who wander away from the church. Preaching was terrible. Music was insipid. There wasn't any real sense of community. And so I wandered into a, a Protestant church while I was, uh, uh, this was after university. So I just started working and I continued going to Protestant churches for several years afterwards. I went to, an Anglican church, but they basically behave like evangelicals. Uh, but it was after a while, it was sola scriptura for me. Mm -hmm. And I started seeing that this wasn't logically consistent, not really historically defensible and just led to all kinds of problems. I then sort of came back to the Catholic church full time. Uh, and also through the works of the early church fathers, because I was at a service and one of the ministers got up and said, if you've just had a, a child uh, and you like it baptized or dedicated, whichever's right for you, please let the church office know. 
And that was, that was quite shocking to me. I thought, wait, do you guys not know which you're meant to do? I mean, I'm kind of open here, but I kind of thought that you would know. And so that was when I started paying more attention to the early Christians, the early church fathers. And as with many people, when you start digging into them, you're either going to become Orthodox or Catholic. Sure. Which uh, early church fathers did you really focus down on? Uh, the, the one that the very first one I read was Clement of Rome. Mm-hmm. And I was just struck by the beauty, uh, like particularly the chapter where he's effectively expanding on 1 Corinthians 13 when he's praising the Corinthians for their love. And that just seemed very beautiful. And there were, there were a few little warning signs in there for me. Mm-hmm. That wait, someone from him is writing to a church in Corinth. That doesn't seem quite right. Uh, and he seems to be doing this for some level of authority and the role of ministers, because uh, Clement was writing to the Corinthians after they had basically kicked out their clergy. And he said, you can't do that. And so the warning bells were a little, little bit off at that point, but it was when I read Ignatius of Antioch that it was kind of over because anyone who's read Ignatius's letters can't help but just fall in love with the guy. He's got so much passion, so much zeal uh, for Christ. He, he writes to the church in Rome and says, don't try and interfere with my upcoming execution. Allow me to be an imitator of the passion of my God. Do not do me an unseasonable kindness while there is an altar prepared. So it was very easy to really love Ignatius, but he also spoke very clearly about Jesus being truly present in the Eucharist, the, mm-hmm. the Eucharist being the flesh which was nailed to a cross and raised by the Father, as well as the importance of the bishop. Mm-hmm. He's obviously the first person, the first extant uh, record we have of the use of the phrase Catholic church. And then I was, I knew, when I read Ignatius, I knew that I was in deep trouble. Right. Yeah. You know, same here. When I read um, Ignatius of Antioch, when I was Protestant, um, I was struck by those two same points. He speaks about the medicine of immortality, referring to the Eucharist, uh, definitely not your traditional Protestant view of the Eucharist mm-hmm. there. And then, of course, he has that threefold distinction in the clergy between bishop, priest, and deacon. So that was definitely um, an eye-opener for me because I was Presbyterian at the time, so we didn't have a uh, distinction between bishops and, and presbyters. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, well, you know, tell me about your ministry itself. I, I see on Facebook, <clears throat> it seems like every other day you're in this or that country and you're giving... <laughs> A, a, a different talk at a different location. What, what exactly are you doing? Well, by day, I'm a mild-mannered software engineer. Uh, and by night, I'm a speaker, I'm a podcaster, and less so now, but also a blogger. Because back in about 2010, I started RestlessPilgrim.net, which was mm-hmm. going to be my website where I wrote about the things that I cared about, sacred scripture, church history, apologetics, and it actually grew out of one of my friends leaving the Catholic church. Mm-hmm. Uh, we'd spent a long time, well, she spent a long time talking and I, I just kept my mouth shut just to hear what, what her main objections were. And then I went home and then wrote her an email ident- identifying some of those particular issues and offering a, a, a defense of it in a way that I thought was, was gentle and winsome. And once I had finished it, I thought I would really like to put this somewhere so other people can read it. Because if, you, if you're zealous about your faith, you often find yourself saying the same thing again and again. And so that was one of the many reasons that I decided to start a blog. And I called it Restless Pilgrim because at the time, scripture just seemed to be shouting at me very, very loudly about how we are a pilgrim people. And I'd continued my study of the early church fathers and I have a particular soft spot for the epistle to Diognetus where the author speaks about Christians residing in their respective countries, but only as aliens. Mm -hmm. And they take part in everything as citizens, but put up with everything as foreigners. Every foreign land is their home, every home a foreign land. And they spend their days on earth, but hold their citizenship in heaven. And this was about the time that I had left England and moved to America. So Mm -hmm. I was, I was, I was feeling a little bit like an alien in a foreign land. Greg, let me give you a chance to jump in here. I'm sure you have a couple questions yourself. Yeah. So, yeah, I wanted to ask, you know, in your view, because this is something when uh, we talked a, a little while back when we're blogging against each other um, about the central view of Christianity. So, you know, what would you say now, which I'm sure you were saying then is the central point of Christianity? Uh, well, just to finish off uh, my faith journey, I ended up uh, discovering the Eastern rites of the Catholic Church. 
And that has certainly shaped my answer. It's like it's refined it and given me a little bit more of a vocabulary as well as the writings of Lewis. Uh, but I would essentially say that the purpose of Christianity is to receive the divine life, be, become partakers of the divine nature, to be transformed like, into Christ effectively, and to be drawn up into the life of the Trinity and stay there forever. Uh, as an Eastern Orthodox, you will almost certainly know this under the term of theosis. And when I discovered the Eastern Church, everything makes sense to me now using that primarily as the lens. That I heard Father Stephen Freeman recently, he spoke and he said that uh, moralism is just teaching corpses to behave, but Christianity is making about dead men live. And so in retrospect, because you came from Protestantism, um, how would that dichotomy between, you know, being that corpse and being alive, how is that different in Roman Catholicism and Orthodoxy and Protestantism? Yeah, that's a tough one, particularly depending upon which part of the Protestant world you're in. Uh, mine wasn't too heavily into the whole imputed righteousness, but I would see that as being the primary difference. Luther described the, the Christian as uh, a, a snow-covered dunghill, um, which never really made sense to me because it's, are we still going to be like that in heaven? If so, it's going to get stinky. Uh, hmm. But in, uh, in Roman Latin rite Catholicism, uh, I certainly heard that, heard that idea very clearly, although different language was used. If you listen to Scott Hahn, for example, he always talks about um, being drawn into the life of the Trinity. Uh, it was just that when I started to attend an Eastern Rite Catholic parish and started consuming both Eastern Catholic and Orthodox materials, that like I say the vocabulary and the emphasis was much more front and center on this idea of theosis, that, that this is what we're called to. In the words of St. Athanasius, God became man so that man could become God, that what Jesus is by nature, we would become by grace. And so, you know, in, in this view, um, what are, how are works involved in salvation? Because that's something, that's a topic I've seen you write about in the past. And quite frankly, I was not very open to your view. So, <laughs> so how would you now, this is more of an insider's conversation and not a polemic. How would you say works are involved in, in salvation? Um, I think I would somewhat stick in my, in, in my usual polemical way of addressing this, because the obvious place to go is the epistle of James. And whenever I would speak to anybody who would be a sola fide in the Protestant sense, because there is a sola fide in the Catholic sense, uh, I would just ask some basic questions that can an incomplete safe, can an incomplete faith save us? Uh, can a, an unfruitful faith save us? Can a dead faith save us? And hopefully everybody would say, well, no, no, it can't. And so that means that we have to have a complete faith, a fruitful faith, a living faith and just ask the question well what is the thing that's missing and at least according to saint james it's works and saint paul says that the most important thing i think this is in galatians he says the most important thing is faith working through love and that's what i would say is theosis that the initiative uh, comes uh, from god's side uh, but that one of the wonderful things about both Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy is you realize that God wants to use fallible human people to impart his life to other people. The fact that every single Christian is meant to be filled with the divine life, it's not just so that they can be put up on a mantelpiece as a trophy. It's so that they can then pass it on to other people. And that's, and that's what we're called to do. We're called to receive the, the grace that we've received as gift and pass it on to other people. Uh, as one of my uh, evangelical heroes used to say, uh, all I am is another hungry beggar telling another beggar where the bread can be found. So uh, how would you, on the topic of love then, how would you say one should live out the command to love neighbor and enemies? <laughs> uh, the, one of the things that C.S. said was that he didn't think that the hardest Christian teaching, the most unpopular Christian teaching, it related to, say, chastity. And I think that's what most, with the toughest thing about Christianity, all those rules about sex. He said, no, it's forgiveness. And when you come to the Gospels, 
you cannot get out of the fact that this is front and center. This is right at the heart of Christianity. You can't take it out of it. When the disciples asked Jesus how to pray, right smack in the middle of there is forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And he doubles down and clarifies multiple times. If you do not forgive your brother, your heavenly father will not forgive you. So we love people primarily by forgiving them. And we do that by loving them. And Lewis in particular, he talks about it out of the phrase, love your, love your, love your neighbor as yourself. He focuses on the as yourself bit. What does that mean that I love myself? And he says that it's not that I primarily like myself because sometimes I know and look at the things that I do and I'm not very proud of myself. I know I can sometimes be pretty terrible. And it's not that I necessarily have to make excuses for the things that I've done because sometimes there's no getting out of it. I had the choice to do good or bad. I chose bad. But Lewis says that we still love ourselves in that we still seek our own good. We still hope that somehow we might still be cured and that we wish that we hadn't done those bad things. And so he says that when we love our neighbors and forgive them, we're just, we're just extending them the same courtesy that we extend to ourselves. When he was a kid, he found it really strange when people would say, hate the sin, love the sinner. He says, that's ridiculous. Surely you've got to you know, judge a man by the things that he does. And he says that he realized that there was one exception. He did that to himself all the time. Hmm. So uh, let, me, let me give this over Back to Mike, mm. unless Mike, you want me to take over. No, no, I know you got a list of questions there. No, I have a, a couple of follow-up questions. So, you know, we, we spoke about the fact that, you know, you have these speaking events where you go from parish to parish and different places. And, um, you know, you have this ministry for anybody who's watching this and they're still trying to figure out their calling. Maybe they know that their vocation isn't, you know, um, to become religious or, um, a priest, but they're still wondering, you know, how to discern what their ministry should be and how they should, uh, you know, spread the word. What would you say, since you have a lot of experiences in this, what would you say is the best measure that they can use to determine uh, what ministry that they can, they can do? Well, Jesus said, seek and you will find. I think that's a pretty good place to begin. And uh, actually, the entire reason that I knew about you guys to begin with was that I was friends with Eric, and I met him on a come and see weekend in Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I considered the priesthood, and I spent a good nine months in discernment. I concluded that I wasn't being called. And a lot of people spent a lot of their time considering their vocation, capital V, so to speak. You know, am I called to the married life? Am I called to ministry, the, the celib celibate state? And uh, at the end of last year, uh, in, here in San Diego, we have a big Christmas gala every year. It's the social event of the season. And the diocese give out um, an award. And this year, I well, this past year, I received the award and I knew that I was going to have about 10 minutes to speak to all of the young Catholics in the diocese. And I, I went with this main point, do what you love and invite people along. Mm -hmm. And this is primarily what ministry is because I, I've, I think I've done it in, in ways that were very short sighted before putting in a, trying to assemble this great thing. Mm -hmm. and then getting burnt out. I think most people who, who have been involved in church ministry for any length of time will have experienced that. Yeah. And so one, uh, to make something sustainable, but two, uh, that it should be fun. Mm. And the, the entire reason I think I even got on the radar of the diocese for that award was because I had recommended one of my friends who had actually just entered the church. She entered the church, then immediately afterwards, she set about setting up a Bible study at the parish and a young adult group because there wasn't one. The fact that she just saw that there was a need and assumed that God was calling her to it. You know, she, there was no great deliberation. There was no waiting for somebody else to ask her. She saw a need. And so she went to her priest and said, I would like to start this. He said, right, go for it. And so she began. And I have lots of my friends who this is pretty much just what they've done. My friend Joseph, when he discovered uh, Mary, the Theotokos, he decided that he wanted to pray the rosary on the beach and he just invited other people along. My friend Kareen, she was struck by the homelessness in downtown San Diego. And so she started making meals and then bit by bit, more and more people came and joined her. And now there's mm -hmm. a ministry that goes down there. And my friend Joe, he really loves scotch. And so 
every now and again he has a scotch evening and invites uh, a bunch of people some from our circle and some who are on the edges mm -hmm. but the thing that i was really just trying to communicate to everybody there was that do what you love mm -hmm. and just invite other people along mm -hmm. Yeah. And, don't, and don't wait to be asked. And don't think that the only way that you can serve God is by being a reader, a Eucharistic minister, or even a welcomer at Mass. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd say that's, that's pretty intimidating. I want to interrupt because that's pretty intimidating because I don't know how I could get people to come along with me lying around doing nothing. <laughs> um. <laughs> if you promise a beer while we're lying around doing nothing, I can guarantee you it will be well popular. They'll be there. <laughs> Well, I, I like that rule of thumb that you're using. Do what you enjoy or what you love and invite others along. So, you know, if an individual loves to evangelize, they or, um, or at least they want to evangelize, they want to do apologetics, but they're timid, you know, they're shy, and maybe they have a little bit of confusion about the faith, um, what would you recommend? How, how could they go about maybe pursuing that if that's their passion? Well, I would say if that's their passion, they're doing well because... Evangelism is not an optional part of the Christian life. And as uh, Catholic and Orthodox, we, I would say we typically suck at this. Uh, that's, hmm. that's, that we, we let the Protestants go and evangelize people. We wait until they become Protestant. Then we give them our apologetics and then they can you know, move over to the church next door. Um, but no, Evangelii Nuntiandi is the go-to document on this. And it says that the very, the very essence of the church's character and purpose and mission is evangelize. And so that means that every Catholic, if you are baptized and confirmed, that means that you're also uh, a missionary. And uh, when, I, when I give talks on evangelism, I just see the fear in everybody's eyes as I say that. And they're, they're thinking all of the excuses that I know I think of every single time I, I'm either having to speak or I'm called upon to share my faith as to why I wouldn't be the, the perfect means to, to do this. Um, but you know, we have to go back to, firstly, the promises of scripture. I'm thinking of the, the prophet Jeremiah, Acts of the Apostles, the promise that the Spirit of God will give us the words to speak. Um, but even before that, to have something that would motivate somebody to come and ask us about our faith. The priest who baptized me, Father Nicholas, he always used to say, don't give people the answers until they ask the questions. Mm. And so we need to be living a life less ordinary such that it invites questions. Mm. And the temptation here is to pull out that uh, um, apocryphal saying of St. Francis to preach the gospel at all times, use words if necessary, because that's sort of right. And St. Francis definitely wanted his, his brothers to preach the gospel at all times in all of their actions. But the point is that there will have to come a time when we need to speak. You know, I would, I would trot out that line very regularly as an excuse for not actually sharing my faith. Right. And one of my friends asked me, what exactly was it that I was doing that was causing everybody to reconsider their lives when they saw the life of David Bates? And I realized that my life didn't actually look that much different. Mm. And even when it did, I didn't really know quite what to say. Yeah. Again, from the evangelical world, you are presented with the gospel very clearly, really very regularly. You know, that, that kerygma of what Christ has done. And so I would say anybody that wants to evangelize, you need to, first of all, come to really good grips with the kerygma. Read the Acts of the Apostles. Read the speeches of the first disciples of Jesus about what God had done, because that's what the world needs. That is, is the good news. But then also be ready to be able to tell your story, mm -hmm. because everybody has a story of how God has moved in their life. And we're always we're always tempted to think that our own story isn't that special. You know, we all want to have that story of, you know, the, the mafia boss drug dealer who has a road to Damascus experience and then completely changes that, changes that person's life. But that's not us. And I'd honestly say that doesn't have to be the case. Mm -hmm. that even if God has been moving in a slow, imperceptible way in your life, the fact that you've always been a believer, that is still a story that is worth telling. So I would say be ready to tell your story and at whatever length you might have the opportunity to share it. Sometimes you might be having dinner with somebody and get to tell the longer story. Sometimes it might be a cup of coffee. Sometimes you might just be in an elevator for 20 seconds and somebody would ask you about why do you always wear that cross? I, I heard earlier that you're Catholic. Why are you Catholic? Mm. And are you ready to, to tell that story? And then are you also somewhat prepared to respond to objections? And that's when apologetics comes in. 
because I also give talks on apologetics and it's, it's always tempting to, for ha to have apologetics being the shiny hammer that we get, get to smash every single nail that we see. Uh, rather than viewing apologetics as a means of clearing away obstacles to enable people to believe. Mm. So addressing just some of the impediments that they might have uh, to conversion. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. And you can do a little bit of preparation for this. Mm -hmm. I, would, I would say I'd always want everybody to be always growing, to be a, a, a curious Christian such that when you have questions about your faith or your practice, you go looking part of your life that when you hear a, a, a Bible passage, passage proclaimed in the liturgy or a mass and you don't fully understand it and you maybe didn't get all of your questions answered in the homily, that you go and do some personal study or go and talk to somebody else about it because other people are also going to have these questions and you are, you're at the fountainhead. You can, you can drink from the stream and there are, there, are, there, are, there are people outside in the world who don't have any water at all. Yeah. Um, I have some additional questions, but first let me uh, give Craig, let me give you another chance to jump in here. Let's see, which question should I ask? <laughs> Any of Can I, look, if, if we could get into history, because that's more my wheelhouse, mm -hmm. you know, could you, could you speak about the liturgy of the early church? What was it like and what's it compared to, let's say, what you would see in the Latin Rite Church or an Eastern Rite? This is one of my one of one of my favorite things to talk about because mm -hmm. there's a lot of misinformation or basic ignorance about what happened in the early church. Because I've met people that said we have no idea of what happened in the early church other than what we have in Acts of the Apostles and the Epistles. Beyond that, we don't really know what happened until, say, the Diet of Worms. Um, but that's that's not the case. You know, the we don't know as much as we would like because of. It's just antiquity. It was a long time ago. Um, the Christians were a persecuted minority. And also the fact that the early church practiced the discipline of the secret, the fact mm -hmm. that they wouldn't, they wouldn't talk too readily with non-Christians about what happened in their services. But despite that, we still have an awful lot of information about what those early Christians did. And when I, when I, when I give a talk about this, because a lot of people have heard that you know, maybe things are really strange and weird in the early church. I say that, hey, I'm going to read a little bit of one of what happened at one of the early Christian gatherings. And if you think you have an idea of what the responses might be, just, just call it out. And so I'll begin, the Lord be with you. And of course, everyone responds, and with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord. It is proper and right. And then they start to laugh because they realize they know this liturgy. Mm -hmm. that although things have naturally changed and altered over time, there is a core to what the first Christians did back in the first century, which continues through until today. And I'll often spend a little bit of time talking about uh, what the Jewish religion looked like in the first century and about what they would do when they gathered. I'm thinking of things like uh, the Kabura fellowship meal or one of the, say, the Toda sacrifice Mm -hmm. which literally means the Thanksgiving sacrifice and the Passover seed and meal. And then from there, talk about what the Christians were doing in the first century, by and large, taking these Jewish liturgies and just adding a Trinitarian aspect, a, a messianic uh, aspect that what the synagogue was, was, was looking forward to the Christian home church was proclaiming had been fulfilled, that God had visited his people and redeemed them. And so we look at the synaxis, which is, basically the template for the liturgy of the word and the Eucharist, which anyone that goes to a uh, Orthodox Catholic and um, uh, even some Anglican services and even some Lutheran, it, it would look very, very familiar as well as the agape, the, the love feast, the church potluck for, mm -hmm. for want of a better word. Uh, the, uh, to know that there was something equivalent to the coffees and donuts that we tend to get today. <laughs> Early church fathers, Ignatius of Antioch, Justin Martyr, Hippolytus of Rome, and, and, and look at what they say about what Christians do when they gather. Mm. And Justin Martyr in particular is, is, is very clear when he's outlining what Christians do mm. when they gather. The fact that they're meeting on a Sunday rather than on the Sabbath and why that's important, that it was the day that God brought forth the world from matter, and more importantly, it was the day that Christ rose from the dead. And he breaks down the steps of what happens in the mass. And it looks really, mm -hmm. really familiar. And then what I do is that I then conclude by having a bit of a workshop. We actually go through an abridged version of the liturgy of 
of St. James from about the fourth, fifth century. And, you know, I, I will briefly ordain somebody to be a priest. I'll have a couple of deacons, uh, a choir, catechumens, and we will go through the liturgy so they can see how we've moved from Ignatius to Justin to uh, Hippolytus and now to St. James and seeing its organic development. And also, when it comes to the end of the liturgy of the word, I get to kick out the catechumens out of the, out of the <laughs> everybody. <laughs> you know, I, I find that very interesting. Really enjoys I, that. I um, wrote a the, brief theological commentary on the liturgy of St. James. So I found it very interesting that you did a talk on that. Ha, have you participated in an actual liturgy of St. James? I have. I have. My, my parish, we last year on the Feast of St. James, we celebrated the Liturgy of St. James with the Melkite community in our city. Yeah. Yeah. And I and, find it fascinating that the Eastern Orthodox still also uh, celebrated on occasion, of course, uh, in Jerusalem on his feast day. And I, I want to say that there's another point in time in which it's um, sometimes celebrated. Craig, you can step in here and uh, correct me if there's an additional time other than on his feast day, but I want to say that there is. But I, I find it fascinating. It's still extant because it's really one of the oldest liturgies that I've seen. Is is that from what you've seen in your liturgical research that pretty much the case? Yeah. I mean, there there are other liturgies that are also old and even that sometimes don't even include the words of institution because mm-hmm. in the very early church, mm-hmm there wasn't an institution narrative. There was a Thanksgiving offered like the one that Jesus would have offered. Right. Um, but I particularly like going through the liturgy of St. James because there's enough commonalities between the Western mass and in particular, the divine liturgy. And I'll then usually invite everyone if I'm giving this talk somewhere in, uh, near San Diego to come to my church and see the successor. So, to speak of the liturgy of St. Anthony, the liturgy of St. Basil or St. John Chrysostom. And even when we're going through, when we're reading through the liturgy of St. James, anyone that's been to an Orthodox church will know that we like to sing our liturgies. Mm-hmm. And so sometimes I have real difficulty not just singing the responses because I know the music that goes along with this. Mm-hmm. Now, on that note, though, would you say that the austerity of a, a Western liturgy, like a, we're not talking about what angle, you know, whether he's facing you or not facing you or something like that, but the sort of austerity and movements of a Western liturgy do, would you, do you think that is earlier than, the, uh, than what we see in the Eastern liturgies in the 4th century, 5th century that they were written? I think that's sort of hard to say because particularly, say, with regards to music, we only start hearing about that later in church history um, and particularly with uh, Ambrose and the rise of Ambrosian chant and the Gregorian chant. Um, so, yeah, I'm not... I, th- I think that the data is somewhat, it, we, I, we would probably need more to be able to say it, but I think you could at least say that in the early church, you, you, you clearly see seeds of things that look like a Western mass and things that look like an Eastern divine liturgy. You know, I, I don't know if this is true or not, but I've heard that at least some have celebrated the liturgy of St. James and, um, with communion in the hand. Is that how y'all did it with the Melkites? And how exactly did that work? Could, could you maybe describe that since I'm, I'm assuming this was leavened bread or unleavened bread? Or? Uh, from what I remember, it was leavened bread. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, uh, did they, I'm trying to remember if they actually gave it to us. Normally we have an intinction. So mm-hmm. body and blood together and it's served within. Definitely wasn't that time. And I'm trying to think if, if the, uh, the body was just placed directly in our mouths or whether we did receive in the head. Mm-hmm. I want to say it was actually placed into our mouths. Mm-hmm. Okay. Just kind of was curious how that works because, you know, the way I heard it is it's of course done by hand, but then you have living bread there. So how, you know, how exactly did they avoid, um, you know, having some of the particles of the Eucharist fall on the floor, but you're saying they essentially just had intention. Did they have an addition, a, a, dish, a um, a deacon there assisting, kind of holding the chalice and the priest dips it in there and, and gives it to you? Yeah, the, from, from what I recall, yeah. Mm, yeah. If you've ever visited um, an Anglican ordinary at parish, that's, mm. the, they, they still yeah. follow intinction. Of course, it's still somebody with holy orders who's doing the intincting. Yeah, that, that's actually how back in 2012 I joined the Catholic Church was, was through the ordinary. Um, oddly enough, I have never been to an ordinary at 
mass, uh, but I <laughs> joined through the ordinary in a very, very roundabout way. <laughs> yeah, I, because I, I, I um, was received sacramentally through a Novus Ordo parish, but registered uh, through the ordinariate because long story short, we had a community of people who wanted to establish an ordinariate here, but we mm-hmm. didn't have enough people to really get a priest. So we were, we were registered at a parish, but in order to be sacramentally received into the group, you had, you had had to go to a Novus Ordo parish. So. <laughs> well, if you ever get the chance, I definitely oh, I- recommend going. I have visited uh, some ordinary parishes, just, you know, haven't actually uh, been part part of the liturgy. Although I do take that back. I take that back. I was there when Monsignor Steenson um, was installed as mm-hmm. the um, ordinary. This was before Bishop, uh, I guess you, you would say Lopez or Lopez. Um, L-O-P-E-S, not sure how you pronounce it. I think it's a little different than, than Lopez, but it was prior to him. Uh, there was a Monsignor who was installed in um I was there for that liturgy in Houston. So I, I take that back. I was at one of the liturgies, but yeah, it, it's definitely fascinating with the uh, ordinary at how Benedict the 16th essentially made a provision for Anglicans who want to keep an Anglican patrimony, but come into the church. What he essentially did is established a community uh, for them where they're not under um, any local ordinary or Bishop, you know, that is part of the, uh, Latin Rite or the Eastern Catholic Churches. It's a separate uh, jurisdiction that is uh, particular to the individual. So it's a personal ordinariate with either a Monsignor who's over it or a bishop. So it's it's very fascinating to any you know viewers who watch this who haven't heard of the Anglican ordinariate. Please look into it. Um, Greg, did you have any uh, follow up questions on the liturgy before I go into the the uh, next topic? Well. Um... On the liturgy itself, I just had maybe a follow-up comment, which would be like you even see like in the letters against Christians, they accuse the Christians of being cannibals and of orgies. And you tell it's just misportraying that they believed the bread and wine was Christ's flesh and blood and there were love feasts and things of that effect. So to, uh, to piggyback and what was being said, it's not that we don't know have any idea of how the early church conducted worship, you could even perceive the liturgical aspect from the church's detractors at the time. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Which I I found it fascinating because as, as you mentioned, you know, a few of them were saying that, um, you know, Christians, since they're meeting in private, they must be having these orgies and uh, eating human flesh, which of course, you know, is an allusion to the Eucharist. So it's definitely interesting. Um, but you it know, tells they, you something about the pagan mind. Yeah, absolutely. But, <laughs> but David, you mentioned something interesting, the um, the discipline of the secret, mm-hmm. where, where they kept, you know, basically the liturgical practices and what would happen with the uh, Eucharist. They would keep that pretty much private. You know, as you noted, um, there's a point in the liturgy where they pretty much kick out everybody other than those who have been fully initiated. Even the catechumens are kicked out. Um, and then only those who are fully initiated are able to see what's going on with the mysteries. It's interesting that that was their disposition back then and how it's so different now. And um, I kind of wonder if if we w- might benefit a little bit from that, if we perhaps return to it. I mean, what, what are your thoughts on that? I'm all in favor of kicking everyone out. Um, (laughs) Yeah, that disposition you find very early. Uh, You find quoted very often Christ's words about not casting pearls before swine Mm -hmm. in reference to the the consumption of the Eucharist and also just the liturgy in general. The the fact that these things are sacred. And even in in the Eastern liturgy, uh, when the priest comes out from behind the Oconostasis, he says, holy things for holy people. and so there's just this idea that th- this is something you need to be initiated into. You can't just run straight into it. Um, and even just from an evangelistic point of view, I've often felt that when you're taking a friend to either a Western mass or a divine liturgy, how do you prepare them? One, one of the posts I recently uh, wrote was attending mass for the first time because one of my friends had invited her friend to mass and he'd never set foot inside a church before. And so I wanted to give him some kind of preparation for what he is about to see. But when we consider the, the richness of 
all of our liturgies, there's so many things that you, that you want to share and help people to understand the allusions to uh, the, the Levitical cult and uh, worship of Israel, where we have echoes, the, the, the biblical typology, uh, the, the symbolism behind the, the vestments and uh, the entire architecture of the church. There's so much that to be said, it's almost you don't even kind of know where to start. Now, in some ways, I think that can be good. Like I think Prince Vladimir, when he sent out missionaries to find out what religion was his country going to be, they come back from Hagia Sophia and they say, we didn't know if we were on earth or in heaven. And there is something about the alien nature of the liturgy um, and uh, uh, its, its strangeness is beautiful and alluring and makes you want to learn more. Um, but at the same time, there's an awful lot of very confusing things that happen that mm -hmm. could leave somebody with more questions than they had right. answers. So I don't know. I, I've, I've seen churches where they do actually dismiss their catechumens. So anybody that's in our CIA, um, that, right, even, even before sometimes the courses even started, that after the liturgy of the word, they will then go and get their own formation. Mm -hmm. And I think there is something to be said for that. Um, and also it then leaves you with that anticipation for the day when you can come and stay for the entirety of, of the sure. liturgy, as well as just his historical continuity with how the early church did things. Mm. You know, and it makes sense that they would pretty much have dispensed with that discipline once the empire, you know, was, was Christianized and, and most people um, became Christian. It makes sense that they would really dispense with that. But now that we find ourselves um, in a culture where a lot of people, even if they may identify as Christians, they're, they're really not, um, especially of an, you know, an ancient apostolic faith. Um, it, it might make a little more sense to perhaps return to that discipline. So it's, it's, it's definitely uh, interesting to see how this may pan out in the future. If, if it were to happen, I don't think it will be anytime soon, though. <laughs> I think, I think uh, but you, with all of the deacons would need time to buff up, you know, to it, throw people out. <laughs> to of kick the them out, right. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, speaking about, you know, the church, um, essentially, well, the community and the, um, the empire essentially becoming Christians, the Christians pretty much conquered the world. And I know that you had a talk about this where uh, the early church conquered the world. Could you maybe speak to that? Tell us how they conquered the world and maybe show us how it might apply for us to re-evangelize and reconquer the world uh, since it is clearly not Christian any longer. Yeah. I, when I started studying the early church, it was, I found it fascinating and exciting because you saw an entire world, an entire empire that was so radically far from Christianity in terms of their views about women, marriage, children, the disposability of people, human dignity. Christianity was born into an environment that was incredibly hostile to it. And even its founder died. To all intents and purposes, it looked like a failure. Yet somehow, somehow this movement from within Judaism manages to conquer the empire. Hmm. And I couldn't help but try and work out what, what to do this because for, for ancient Rome, I would suggest not entirely. <laughs> um, so when I read through the early church fathers, I was looking for what was it that they were doing that made such a difference. Uh, and a book that I'd really recommend here is when the church was young by Marcelino D'Ambrosio, where mm -hmm. he walks through the early church fathers and shows that what the early church fathers were dealing with were not that different from controversies that we have today in a society mm -hmm. that we have today. Um, but particularly focusing on those, uh, those early fathers like Ignatius and Polycarp and Justin, you, you see a few things. One was the fact that they had a robust intellectual tradition, that they, were with, that they could engage with the pagans who uh, and that they could offer an explanation for the faith in a clear and concise manner, something which we obviously always need, if nothing else than just to fulfill 1 Peter 3.15, to always be ready for, uh, to give an answer for the hope that we have within us. So they were always ready, but they were also ready to give their lives. Martyrdom seems so central in the early church to both witness the truth of the gospel um, and to inspire other Christians to 
to, to bravery, to stand up for their faith. I already mentioned Ignatius pleading with the Church of Rome not to try and interfere with his execution because he was viewing it in primarily Eucharistic terms, um, as was St. Polycarp, um, who just showed unflinching faithfulness to Christ, mm -hmm. that when it was between the church and the state, he went with the church every time. When he was told, listen, you're an old man, just, just, just renounce Christ and, and offer the sacrifice to Caesar. He says, no, 80, 60 years I've served him, and he's done me no wrong. How could I then blaspheme my king and my savior? Mm -hmm. And so he knew, render to Caesar what is Caesar's, but to God's what is God's. And he was a bishop who wasn't afraid to do that and to pay the consequences for his insubordination. Uh, and the other thing that I noticed in the early church was how they were willing to engage with pagan culture. And this was something of a controversial uh, issue. People such as Tertullian uh, said that what does Athens have to do with Jerusalem? But by and large, the early church fathers saw that they could use, they could, they could put uh, this Greek pagan philosophy to the service of the church, that it could be baptized and redeemed. And the areas where the church grew was the areas that had been prepared by this pagan philosophy. Because apart from that, they had given them a language for speaking about immaterial terms. And much like St. Paul on Mars Hill, they came to proclaim to these people the God that they worshiped in ignorance, but now that they could find out the totality of his revelation. Mm -hmm. So just when I looked at the church, I saw that they were witnesses in their ink, or in the, what they wrote, how they engaged pagan culture. And also they were witnesses in their own blood. And to come back to Tertullian again, he said, the blood of the martyrs is seed of Christians or seed of the church. Uh, and when I read the early church, uh, I'm encouraged because a, a, a movement that had no great powerful uh, political clout, no army, they managed to convert a world. And if God can do it once through them, through the power of his spirit, he can do it again through us. Well, what are maybe just kind of as a final question on my part, and then I'll, I'll turn it over to uh, Craig to ask any final questions or make any concluding comments. Um, what are some of the devotions that you practice in your personal life and that you might recommend, you know, viewers and listeners to uh, practice themselves? Okay. I'm not going to be especially creative here, <laughs> uh, but obviously uh, I grew up as a Latin Rite Catholic. And so I still have um, a very big place in my heart for Eucharistic adoration. Uh, I'm a little weird in that I just like to read during adoration. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was because in my family, when we would have Saturday afternoons or Sunday afternoons together, we would all gather together in the same room, but everybody would have a book. So we're spending time with people that I loved mm -hmm. and also reading. So in my mind, I just transfer that over to Eucharistic sure. adoration. Yeah. Uh, but also because I go to an Eastern parish, I pray the Jesus prayer on the, uh, on the chain, Comboschini or Chopki, whatever name you want to call it. Uh, but it's a very short prayer, Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Uh, and with any of my bead prayers, I don't do very well if I'm told to kneel down or to sit. Mm -hmm. uh, if I'm praying either my Comboschini or the rosary, I like to walk because I'm doing it. Yeah. But I'm oh. just weird like that. No, no, <laughs> no, I, I hear you. Um, just, just curious at the Eastern uh, parish there, do y'all, do y'all have adoration there or do you go to a Latin rite parish for that? No, I'll go to a Latin rite parish for that. Um, that's, that's, uh, that's a Latinization. We, Mostly a Latin thing. We don't I tolerate really, such things. <laughs> right. I haven't really heard of any uh, Eastern Catholic parishes having it, but just, just was curious. No, the, the emphasis in these is typically on the divine office. And that's also part of, part of my life. Although it's an, again, an odd mix of the Western divine office and right. the divine office. So I'll pray night prayer, Western night prayer with my girlfriend each night. Mm -hmm. uh, but then we have Vespers at my parish on a Saturday uh, evening. Uh, but actually at my Byzantine parish up in Seattle, where I lived for several years, uh, there was a great devotion to the rosary. And so people still to this day pray the rosary before liturgy. And Interesting. It, it's just something that the, that the parish had picked up. I think probably largely because uh, they were made up of a lot of right. Western Rite Catholics right. um, who just loved it. The priest allowed it. And I <laughs> yeah. to quote Charlton Heston, you can tear my rosary from my cold dead hands. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Craig, uh, let, me, let me give you a chance to jump in here and ask any final <laughs> questions or make any final comments, if you have any. 
I uh, I don't know if we have the time to unpack, but the uh, the article there was an article like we referred to earlier in this show. Um, pretty much three hundred things before Constantine, um, mm-hmm. before the year three hundred that teach that the Roman Catholic Church is what the early church was doing, and with nifty pictures of the movie Three Hundred, you could tell how old this blog post is that this. <laughs> This was relevant at the time. And uh, it aged, so it aged it immediately. <laughs> <laughs> but then uh, I wrote a response to that article. And uh, so I was just wondering if what, what in that, if you even remember the response, what was going through your head at that time? I'm just curious. Okay. So just to give a little bit of context, uh, I regularly encountered Protestants who told me that when Constantine became emperor that was when the catholic church started that's when you get all of this stuff that you guys believe and i heard it again and again and again and i wanted to write a post that was suitably succinct but just gave a a brief survey of some of the things that christians did and said and believed prior even to constantine's birth so it's just it you know he can't affect things before he was born i figured that was reasonably fair so just to give a brief survey of some of the things that you see in the early church that look and sound awfully Catholic. So I had written that. And as you recently gave in your testimony, uh, you spoke about hanging out around shamelesspopery.com. And (laughs) I'm friends with Joe and I would regularly be in the comment sections as well. And that was when I first encountered you. And uh, it's funny, we have quite a few East uh, East Orthodox and Catholic friends uh, that every now and again, when we would chat on Facebook, it's like that Craig guy. Yeah, he's actually he's like reading the early church and stuff. It's like, <laughs> oh, he's going to make a great Catholic. Oh, no, he's going to make a great Eastern Orthodox. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I can't remember if you and I had, had directly spoken about this, but yeah, you then wrote a response to, uh, I, think, I think I had at least 15 uh, uh, of, of some of these doctrines. And you gave a response. And it was actually at a time in my life that was very busy. So I don't think I got to it for a couple of months. I think I did a brief response saying, great stuff, I'll respond to it. And then when I finally had a little bit of break in my life, I went and clicked on the link again. And um, things had changed. Uh, and then I heard from various various quarters that you had become Eastern Orthodox. And uh, we had a brief conversation on that because the article was still up at, at that point. And I said, it's like, um where do you stand on this now? Because I can't help but feel that you're kind of on my side with most of this. Yeah, that, that, that's, that, that was interesting because a lot of it was, uh, especially early in my conversion, was like, uh, I was more kicking and screaming. I have to be orthodox. I don't want to be schismatic, but I'm not fully convinced all the historical arguments. And I think it speaks to the difficulties someone in your position that you have this burden of proof in you know 2,000 words or less Mm -hmm. because it's a blog post prove absolutely the early church definitely taught this categorically you can't do that in 2,000 and 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 and, so if you try and boil it down everyone says that you're cherry-picking quotations and they're out of context exactly so I apologize for making that accusation (laughs) but it's uh but it, it does speak to I think sometimes certain things the the church fathers write are more nuanced and uh, so don't always fit within the categories of uh, debates between Protestants and Roman Catholics and Orthodox. But it's, uh, it was just interesting. So I do remember this replies were, replies were always charitable. And, uh, and so even now I've decided I'm keeping all my old stuff up because it gives an opportunity for someone to refute it. And it also is a testimony in look how I evolved on this issue but i just i just thought that was funny yeah i your your point about um the nuance and everything else i i think is really important uh i i always see apologetics as kind of like two-tier sometimes you need a little bit of shock and awe to knock somebody out of their um original perception so somebody has heard from their past or jack chick track about all of these things that came in. And sometimes it's really handy just to present to somebody a fairly short but kind of fairly damning collection of evidence that will at least shock you out of thinking that, oh, this is all clearly just after Constantine. And you either have to retreat into, you're just cherry picking them, I don't believe you, all of this, all, all the early church fathers are fabricated, um, or you will at least start to concede, ah, maybe there is something more 
to the early church and maybe it didn't look quite like my local evangelical church. And then the more important dialogue and discussion then starts to happen. Yeah, that's why I think, let's say, like James White essentially takes position, you know, more than the early church fathers knew because they didn't know enough languages. They didn't have enough manuscripts. They didn't have computer programs, all these things. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, that it seems to be the only position a Protestant can take once they start interacting with enough of the evidence. Yeah. And and so, yeah, so that's shock and awe, right? Mm-hmm. You're not going to presume, oh, that person knows Tert- Tertullian's, you know, Montanist stage versus his Catholic stage. Like, just to let them know, hey, this is out there because mm-hmm. it will open their eyes. There's this whole other world that they haven't considered pretty much. And, and also not trying to, I think, prove too much. So even in, that, even in that article, I make reference to the importance of Rome, but that's as big as my claim gets. It's just trying to communicate the idea that, listen, Rome just wasn't insignificant. It wasn't just another city. It wasn't just that there were some other bishops. You find very high praise of Rome. Now, I've had some responses like, this doesn't prove papal infallibility. It's like, I know, I know, that's what, that wasn't what I was trying to prove. <laughs> but it does at least set up, set up a narrative and a context to see when you, at least at first glance, even if you just assume goodwill and the fact that I haven't just made up all of these quotations or they're not all elaborate forgeries uh, by the Vatican, uh, that perhaps there's more going on in church history than you previously thought and that that warrants a more detailed investigation. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll actually uh, need to go and read these articles. I haven't read either one of them yet, so <laughs> I'll, I'll definitely be doing that. Uh, well, David, thank you for joining us. I, I really enjoyed it. I definitely would like to have you on the show again, if you're available. Absolutely. That'd be a lot of fun. All right. Good deal. Craig, always good to have you. Good to be here. Thank you. Yes, indeed. So everyone, please comment, like, subscribe, share the video. And until next time, God bless you all. And go share your faith. Thank you.